2 Corinthians. Can you turn through in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9? Now, I was chatting to um, Angelina about this, and she said, you are going to read it all, aren't you, Malcolm? So, at the instructions of Angelina, we're now going to read most, not all, of um, chapters 8 and 9 of 2 Corinthians. As you know, we've been following this together, and uh, Paul gets to a point where he's going to talk to the Corinthians about an offering that is being taken up for the Christians in Jerusalem. Now... Have any of you ever felt really hungry? Catherine has. I'm not talking about a bit peckish. I mean really hungry, grindingly hungry. Nigel, you have. Yes. How long had you not eaten for? Uh, Two days. Two days, goodness. Why? Uh, We were just stuck with We ate all the food too quickly, basically. (laughs) And our journey, we got lost as well. Wow, so two days without food, and you got lost, so you were walking. And one Mars bar left, and we did actually almost fight over it. A Mars bar that was nearly fought over. Anybody got anything better than that in terms of hunger? So we haven't experienced grinding hunger. Have you ever been in a famine? Well, the church in Jerusalem, the Jewish church in Jerusalem, had, had, were experiencing a famine. And so Paul was talking to those in Greece, in Corinth, Macedonia, I think it's Macedonia, um, to see if they will give an offering. And the Corinthians had said, yes, we're going to go for it. They'd said it, you know, they're going to say, yeah, we're going we're to make an offering to these Christians in Jerusalem. And they haven't yet done it, though. So Paul is now writing to them in this letter about that. Shall we have a look at this letter together? Chapter 8 of 2 Corinthians. And now, brothers, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches... Out of the most severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. Does that confuse you? Their poverty welling up in rich generosity? Amazing. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service of the saints. And they did not do as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then to us in keeping with God's will. So I urged Titus, since he had earlier made a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. But just as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness and in your love for us, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. I'm not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. And here is my advice about what is best for you in this matter. Last year, you were the first not only to give, but also to have the desire to do so. Now finish the work so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it according to your means. For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what he does not have. Our desire is not that others might be relieved while you are hard pressed, but that there might be equality. At the present time, your plenty will supply what they need so that in turn, their plenty will supply what you need. Then there will be equality, as it is written. He who gathered much did not have too much, and he who gathered little did not have too little. I thank God who put into the heart of Titus the same concern I have for you. For Titus not only welcomed our appeal, but he is coming to you with much enthusiasm and on his own initiative, and we are sending along with him the brother who is praised by all the churches for his service to the gospel. What is more, he, has chose, he was chosen by the churches to accompany us as we carry the offering, which we administer in order to honor the Lord himself and to show our earnestness to help. We want to avoid any criticism of any way in which we administer this liberal gift, for we are taking pains to do what is right, not only in the eyes of the Lord, but also in the eyes of men. In addition, we are sending with them our brother 
who has often proved to us in many ways that he is zealous and now even more so because of his great confidence in you. As for Titus, he is my partner and fellow worker among you. As for our brothers, they are representatives of the churches and an honour to Christ. Therefore show these men the proof of your love and the reason for our pride in you so that the churches can see it. Going on to chapter 9 and we'll go through to verse 6. We now come to an agricultural theme of sowing and reaping. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver, and God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, lots of alls there, you will abound in every good work, as it is written, he has scattered abroad his gifts to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You'll be made rich in every way so that you can be generous in every occasion and through us your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of God's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have proved yourself, men will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. And in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace of God has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Quite a, quite a couple of chapters, isn't it? Um, and he's talking throughout those chapters about them giving, particularly to the Christians, the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem facing a famine. He's utterly unashamed to speak about money. Now I have to say, as a minister, and I'm very grateful for the support of this church that releases me to minister here and in other places at times, it's kind of hard for us sometimes to speak about giving. Lots of ministers um, ask somebody else to do it. Did you know that? They'll get somebody else in to talk about financial giving, but I think that's wimping out of it really. And chapters 8 and 9 are here, and we're covering 2 Corinthians, so that's why we're looking at it. Paul had no scruples about giving, and here he's appealing to those Christians in Greece to benefit these other Jewish Christians. Now I want you to notice um, a few things about, um, as we read this passage, it's amazing really. Um, if you look at it, there's this wonderful response from these Gentile Christians. I just want to highlight a few of the responses. Have a look at chapter 8 and verse 4. Here... We've got some poor Christians in Macedonia. Paul's saying they're poor. And what are they doing? The poor church in Macedonia pleads with Paul for the privilege of sharing in the service to the saints in Jerusalem. Do you like, I like, don't you think it's fantastic? Can we, give, can we give something? Now, we had something approaching that um, just coming up to Christmas. Do you remember Nigel talked about rope and digging a well? Um, I think, did you feel that you had a few people pressing money in your palm, Adrian, over that? I felt, oh, is, can I, I know it's gone, but can we give some to this? It was lovely, wasn't it? Um, and so that was, I'm not, I'm not saying we're quite at the same extremes of these Macedonian Christians, but it was lovely to see, really, really lovely to see. And then in verse 11 of chapter 8, it goes on, it says, Now finish the work so that your eager willingness... Paul sees the Corinthian church as eager and willing to give. So I guess the question that this particular text raises in my mind is, what had these Gentile Christians got which made them such enthusiastic givers? Does that seem a good question? Well, 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 you know, I, don't, I, just, I just think it's interesting. They're, they're giving out of poverty. They're, they're eager and willing to give. These are wonderful statements, aren't they? I kind of want to ask the question, what has transformed in them the painful duty into a duty-free privilege? Do you like that? 
I enjoyed writing that. Anyway, moving on. Um, what converts reluctance in giving to an enthusiastic giver? What is it that changes grudging giving to generous giving? And I think we can find the answers to these questions in our text today. And as you read it, did you notice that the word giving or money was very rarely used? It was used once or twice. But instead, one of the things which is said again and again is the word grace. The grace of giving. God's grace poured out. Paul seems to find a deep connection with the word grace and giving. Interesting. Had you seen that before? Do you spot it? I hadn't spotted that before until I spent some time studying this. If you look at chapter 8, verse 4 again, let's have a look at it. It says, and they pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing. Now, in your NIVs, it says privilege there. I think in most of the versions it says privilege. The actual Greek word is charis, grace. They wanted to have the privilege of sharing in the grace of giving. And so they thought, well, that's a bit difficult. We'll change the word and make it something else, which wasn't perhaps as helpful as it might be. If you go on to chapter 8, verse 6, it comes again. So we urge Titus, since he had eagerly made a beginning, to bring to completion this act of grace. Then again, in verse eight, uh, chapter 8, verse 7, it says, But just as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, in your love for us, see that you also excel in the grace of giving. There seems a connection here, does there not, between giving and grace. So why is giving a grace? You know, and how do these two relate to one another? Well, do you know that our God is a God of grace, isn't he? Full of grace and truth, we were looking at a few months ago. And grace is about unmerited generosity of God, isn't it? The unmerited generosity of God to us as sinners. Does that make sense? Is it surprising that Paul is talking about grace? You see, Paul sees Christian giving as a response to God's grace and an imitation of his grace. So as we give, we are imitating the gracious God who is full of grace, full of generosity. You see, how can you believe in a God of grace, worship a God of grace, and then not act in the same way as him? Do you see? We delight in him. We say, this is wonderful, this is wonderful. Well, how come it's not so wonderful that you want to do it? (laughs) Yeah? So what Paul is really saying here is, if God is generous, how is it possible for his people to be mean? It's not possible. He's, he's saying, surely, if the Son, if the God would not hold back his one and only Son, then we should give, and give generously. So the motivation for giving comes from the very character of God. And as a Christian gives, it reveals the character of God. So as monies are released for ministry, in poor areas, it, people say, God is so gracious. Yeah? We see his gracious acts released through his people giving. Not only is the Christian giving a reflection of God's grace, it shows us that Christian giving is also an expression of God's grace at work by power in that person's life. So as, as one is able to give, generously, abundantly, it reveals that the Holy Spirit is at work in that person's life. You see, there's no separation in the Bible between gospel and giving. The two are seen as partners. There's no separation between belief and behaviour. If we believe something, I think in some ways as Western people, we kind of can believe something over here and allow it not to have any influence on our life over here. You know, I, I, think, I think God is so wonderful and gracious, but I just don't want to be. Doesn't make, the Jewish mindset would never understand that. The two should be utterly together. So, firstly, 
Christian giving is an outflow of the grace of God. And if we are connected and worshipping the gracious God, it will be the most natural thing in the world. And we've seen some of that release occurring in this church. The grace of God being poured out in generosity. Lovely thing to see. Secondly, we then find Paul talking about something else. And he uses the word service to the saints. Did you notice it coming up a number of times? Service to the saints. And as we serve the saints, these saints in Jerusalem, we show our fellowship with the saints. Does that make sense? So as you serve your brother or sister in another place, you are extending fellowship with them. Does that make sense? Yeah? So this is the second thing. So we've got the grace of God being the key motivational force that results in generous Christian giving. And secondly, we've got this service to the saints, this act of fellowship. Have a look. Chapter 8, verse 4 is a key one, isn't it? Have a look at that again. Chapter 8, verse 4. And they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the saints, in this grace of sharing in the service to the saints. It comes again. Chapter 9, verse 1. There is no need for me to write to you about this service to the saints. Do you hear it? This service to the saints to the saints. You see, Christian giving relates directly to his church. Jesus died for his bride, who is the church. And so Paul has got no no hesitation in saying to the Christians in Corinth, do you love what Jesus loves? Do you love his church? Then give to his church. Support his church. Show your fellowship with his church. Does that make sense? So we've got this, can you see the pattern now? God is a gracious God. He pours out his grace undeservedly into our lives. And what do we do? We pass it on. There's that film, pay it on. But we're not going to pay it on, we pass it on. Yeah? And we, we take on that nature of the Lord. He's gracious. And then secondly, We notice that he loves his church. He died for his church. And so what do we do? We extend fellowship to his church. Not simply saying, God bless you, when our brother's in need, or a church we know of is in need. But we look at how we can help practically, financially, yes. And we have done in many ways. But wouldn't it be good if we could do more? In many, many ways. I asked my daughter, Sarah. Are you here, Sarah? She's gone out, has she? What has helped her most in growing in her Christian faith? And she said it was being part of Cheney's Baptist Church. You encouraged by that? Don't go and talk to her afterwards, it'd be embarrassing. (laughs) But um, that made me realise, you know, God had it right when he said, I love my church and I'm going to give to my church. I'm going to pray for my church. My church is my bride, Yeah. Do we show our love for his church? Stuart has helped fund the rebuilding of a church in Moldova. Now, we know that the church isn't the building, but they do need a building. It's pretty cold out there at times as well, isn't it? Very cold, yeah. Stuart's invested in that financially because he believes in the church and in fellowship with this church. Yeah? That's why. Some of us, we don't love his church like he loves his church. And that's why we don't give. But Paul has got it linked. Your fellowship in serving the saints. Serving other Christians in other places. And you see, as we act in this way, can you imagine, can you just imagine as Titus takes this enormous offering off to Jerusalem? Yeah. Now, what, the Jerusalem church is primarily what kind of a church? Um, Jewish or Gentile? Jewish, very good. So here's a whole stack of money coming from those Gentiles. Yeah? Can you imagine it? It arrives and their famine is turned into a feast, or at least enough food for them. What do you think that would do in Jerusalem? Just what do you think it would do? What would it, what would it do? It would be great joy. Do you think they'd be praying for the Gentiles in Greece? Do you think they'd be giving thanks to God? What do you think about the non-Christians in Jerusalem as they see a church that's got enough food? Do you think recruitment of membership would increase? Or am I just too cynical about these things? 
I think it would, don't you? I think there'd be people saying, well, this faith has got legs. It's got food. Jesus truly is the bread of life. Now, Christian giving is always symbolic. It's more than just the money. And as Titus would take that offering to the church in Jerusalem, what did it say about our God? Is he a God of the Jews? Yes, but he's just as much the God of the Gentiles. Can you see that this gift is symbolic of a God who loves the whole of mankind? Do you love that gift now? Does the gift look more important? I think it does to me as I look at it. Obviously, it's great to have food in your tummy as well, but what an amazing gift. Now, think about it. We as a church, regularly at Christmas and Easter in particular, give to Tear Fund. Dawn and I, as a couple, we like to give to Tear Fund. Why do we do that? What are we symbolising as we do that, as a church and as perhaps individuals? What What are we showing? Love. But love for who? Go on, Anne. God, yes, and a God who loves the poor. Our God loves the poor. He cares for the poor. So when we have an offering at Easter or Christmas and we, we make a gift to Tear Fund, we're not just making a gift and saying, well, there you go. We're saying our God cares for the poor. That's what we're saying, isn't it? Can you see that? Can you see that? Yeah, good. good. How about, now, yeah, let's get it closer to home. How about the regular giving by standing order and direct debit to this church? Okay, let's deal with that one. What does that show if somebody sets up a standing order for this church? A generous, regular, you enjoying this, Adrian, as I say this, and their finance team, a regular um, standing order, generous standing order for this church. What does that say? What does it symbolize? Commitment. Commitment to what? Commitment to God. Fantastic. Yeah. A, A commitment to what? To God's church, and obviously a church is just an organisation, but what about, isn't it to the ministry of this church? What is this church doing? I'm going to put my shoulder behind that. Does that make sense? I believe this is important that 34 children have an Easter fun day. I think it's important that this fabric should be good, that when people come in, they say, fantastic, these people care about this place. And I think it's good that as we have that regular giving, we can then regularly give. We can say to Lucy, Claire and Ben and to Debbie and Alan, you know, we're not just going to give you a thousand pounds a year, which is great. You know, I'm not saying it's bad, but it's not. How would you cope on a thousand pounds a year? (laughs) Not very well, would you really? So, but we want to put our shoulder behind it. It's symbolic of saying we believe that the ministry that is happening here at Cheney's Baptist Church is important and we're going to invest in it. Does that make sense? So if you haven't set up a standing order... Do not be just a hearer of the word, be a doer also. Here are some forms. They look a bit, a bit sort of dog-eaten. I think they need to be used, don't you? There we go. They're just at the front there. Pick them up, fill them out, and give them to Sandra. Yeah? Lastly, and it really must be lastly, so I'm getting carried away and we've got communion. The great... So, so, you've got it so far? That Paul says, generous financial giving... Generous Christian giving comes from an understanding of the grace of God poured out in our lives, living in us, working its way out. Secondly, the grace of God is the first one, but secondly, we give because we see that we're in fellowship with brother and sister, doing a work here, doing a work in other places. And as we see that, we give to it. We give to it regularly because we believe it's important. We believe believe God thinks it's important. And that's why we put our resources into that. Lastly, we get to the harvest theme. And I have preached on this before, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. But I just want you to notice, and I think it's important to notice this, in chapter 9, verse 6. It says this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Paul is linking Christian giving to being like a seed. And he's saying it does matter how many seeds are sown. The more you sow, the more you 
reap. Okay? Now, we've seen that over a period of 12 years at Chinese Baptist Church, we've sown six times the amount, nearly. Five times the amount. That's great. What can we kind of hope for, according to this verse? If you've sown five times the amount, hopefully you're looking for a, at least five times more, aren't you? In terms of a harvest. Yeah? Well, I don't know. I'm, not, I'm a mathematician. You know, I'm a counting background, so forgive me. But um, we're looking for a harvest, aren't we? And you've heard something of the harvest that has come. Now, have you, are you dreaming about the future? What harvest would you like to see in 10 years' time? What would you like to see? Start sowing for it. Start sowing for it now. In time, in money, in your prayers, put your shoulder to the plough and see what God will do. See what he will do. I think it's amazing what he's done, don't you? Praise his name. Yeah. But he cannot do it without us putting financial resources into the work of his kingdom. So, to summarise then. Why are these Greeks so generous? Why are they so generous? Because they know the grace of God. Because they love their brother and their sister. And because they understand horticulture or agriculture, don't they? That's why. Have you got it? The grace of God, fellowship with your brother and sister, and understanding the principles of sowing and reaping. This is what I believe Paul is saying to the Corinthian church in chapters 8 and 9. Shall we turn to him in prayer? Father, I thank you for your holy word. I thank you for how it's spoken to me. And I pray that you give me the grace to act based upon your word. I pray for my brothers and sisters here that this word would be heard and responded to. Um, we pray that the resources that we need to do the ministry of this church will be provided, and more than we need, so we can be increasingly generous in every way. And we thank you, Lord, for your promise that you will abound, your, your giving to us will abound as we learn to give as you would want us to as Christians. And forgive us where we have not done this, and may this day be a new start in our financial arrangements. We ask this for Jesus' sake and for the coming of his kingdom. Amen.